Well, hi everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Now, the mount just came back from Celestron. I've, I've leveled it, polar aligned it, and defocused the star Navi. The main reason I wanted to make a video tonight was to demonstrate how to do a star collimation. As you know, the last video that I made, I used the Hotec Advanced SC Collimator to collimate the Richicretion, which is what we're using tonight. And this is the raw result. I mean, to be honest with you, this is pretty good, and I don't think that I'm going to mess with it. Now, what you look for in a star collimation is this donut of a defocused star. Now, traditionally, what you want to see is that the hole in the donut is perfectly centered. Now, as you can tell, this is pretty good. But if you look at it carefully, we've got a nice even margin to this first red circle out just outside of the star. The actual donut itself is shifted over a little bit in this direction. Now we could uh, make some adjustments with this, and I probably am going to give it a try simply for academic purposes. But the main reason that you would want to do a star collimation would be something a little bit different, and that's this. Now we were looking at a Flat Earth video where the gentleman had a Dobsonian telescope. Flat Earthers always seem to have Dobsonian or Alt-As mounts because they like to talk about the sky rotating above the stationary flat Earth. I think using a German equatorial mount like serious amateur astronomers like myself use would just blow their minds. As he was looking uh, and misidentifying stars, I happened to notice that he defocused his stars and then brought it into focus. Now I grabbed a screenshot of his attempt to focus a star and this is the result. Now if you compare this star to mine, notice that it's very oval shaped and that the donut in the center is wildly offset. This telescope is badly out of collimation. Now, without getting into his conspiratorial thinking, I offered to help him with his collimation and I don't think he really understands what I'm even talking about. So I thought maybe I'd just put up an example of poor collimation compared to excellent collimation. Before I show you how to fix this, I'd like to go ahead and just focus on this star, do an automatic focus using Nina, and see how much of a difference good collimation makes versus what I would consider more perfect collimation, which is what we'll try for here in a minute. So let's go ahead and focus on this star and kind of get an idea of where we're starting from. So here the focuser is doing its thing, and in a few seconds we're going to have a nice sharp point. Still focusing, but one thing I want to point out is on a Ritchie Cration telescope where the primary mirror does not move, notice that the star is pretty much staying right in the crosshairs. You're not getting that drift that you classically get with a Smith Cassegrain where you actually focus by moving the mirror in and out. Now, here's an interesting thing about a telescope that has a spider the arms of the spider act almost like a batten off mask, and when you get this to the point that you're just seeing a single spike, you're pretty much in focus, and this isn't all that bad. And it's a good spot to start with our Nina autofocus routine. So let's go ahead and set up Nina, and we'll have a look at that. Well, now the autofocus run is over, and we see essentially a perfect V-shaped autofocus curve. And our resulting HFR is 2.23. Now that's not bad for a telescope of a focal length of about 1,600 millimeters. Let's see if we tweak the collimation, we can make that just a little bit better. I'd like to get it under 2. The RASA runs about 1.5 to 1.25. Now what I'm going to do is go out to the observatory and I'm going to put my hand in front of the telescope uh, corresponding to each of the three collimation screws. And I'm going to identify which screw will move this from the left to the right to kind of even it out a little bit. That's the one that I want to turn, and my initial move will be to loosen it very slightly, probably about an eighth of a turn. Then I'm going to recenter it. That'll tell me whether or not I move the screw in the correct direction. If not, I'll move it back in the other direction. I'll go through a few iterations of that, and we'll see if we can get it really centered up.
Well, it's not absolutely perfect, but let's go see what it looks like when we do a focus routine on it. And there's our focus curve. Uh, notice that we've managed to improve it from about 2.38 down to about 1.98, just by getting that donut hole centered a little bit better in the donut. Now the proof in the pudding is what the telescope will actually do. So I took 33 minute images of a section of the sky that had some asteroids in it. And then I ran them through Tycho Tracker and identified the moving objects. Here's the first one. This is a magnitude 19.7 asteroid. And as you can very clearly see in the crosshairs, it's very easy to identify the asteroid. And more impressively, here is a magnitude 20.1 asteroid. And again, it's very easy to identify it. Now, the asteroids in this field went from 20.1 up to about 21.5. So we can't really see any more than this but still we broke the magnitude 20 barrier. So this is Bob the Science Guy with a quick demonstration of star collimation on a Ritchie Crateon telescope. And it's basically the same procedure for any type of refractor. You want to center that donut hole in the donut. So clear skies everyone, I'm going to go on out and start doing some observations. Take care.